our coastal landscape and environment series of lessons. This is lesson 8a and in this lesson you will be looking at waves and tides. So we'll get into the physics of waves and what they are, what constructive and destructive waves are, how waves break, how waves move energy around and we'll briefly touch on tides um, later in the lesson. So here's a bit more detail about how these uh, things come together on this lesson. So we'll look at, we've looked at cliff profiles before. We'll have a little think about beach profiles today and how um, different types of waves lead, lead to different beach profiles, whether they're, they're shallow or steep, basically. Uh, we'll briefly look at berms and offshore bar landforms, but mainly we'll be concentrating on wave characteristics. So constructive and destructive waves, and how these vary, uh, these waves vary at a variety of scales. So how waves might vary in the short term, you know, if there's a storm event or a bigger swell at sea, or it's been more windy and therefore the waves are bigger or over time. So whether there's variety in um, waves over time. So when we look at a wave, we have a number of um, factors that all waves like this have in common. You may remember this from your GCSE science. So you basically have the wave here shown in blue and this is a, a, a obviously a wave in the sea because here's the water and we have a number of pieces of um, sort of key terms that you need to know. So we have the amplitude of the wave which is basically the not quite the height of the wave but it's basically the difference difference between the, the kind of the where the calm sea level would be and the height above that. The actual height of the wave is the whole distance from wave crest to wave trough. Um, the crests of the waves are at the top and the troughs of the waves are at the bottom and this is just a few other things on here to kind of make the point that the the direction of the wind and the waves obviously goes in the same direction. So here's some terms here that you might need to make a note of in your notes, you might want to pause the video at this point and jot down these key terms about waves. So here's some more key terms for this inquiry question two part of the course. So we've mentioned fetch right at the beginning in lesson one, I think, but basically fetch is the distance of open water over which the wind can blow. So in case you're not getting the point, um, waves are made by wind. So waves form because the wind blows. So we have um, obviously the main types of waves here, constructive and destructive waves. So constructive waves add sediment to a beach, so they have a strong swash and a weak backwash. Destructive waves take things away from a beach or a cliff. So these have a strong backwash and a weaker swash. So um, destructive waves, generally speaking, could be formed by a local storm, and drag sediment, uh, shingle, sand, whatever bits of rock off the beach. We have swash and backwash. So swash is the forward movement of a wave up the beach and the backwash is the backward movement. We've talked about the crest of a wave. Um, this is what you know, surfers talk about. Uh, the Beach Boys famously had a, a song about crests of waves, many songs about waves in fact. And uh, obviously we know what a beach is but here's a handy definition in case you need to produce one in the exam. So maybe again you might want to pause the video at this point and take a quick note of these key terms. So I mentioned before that waves are made by the wind blowing. So the stronger the wind is, the longer it blows for, the further the wind blows, the, di the further the distance it blows, the longer the fetch, in other words, the larger the wave will be and the more energy it will have. Waves also um, change as they approach the shore because due to other factors that we'll come on to in a minute. So waves break when they approach the shore. Waves are not breaking in the middle of the sea unless it suddenly becomes shallow at a certain point. So we have big waves out in the sea, but they don't break until they reach the shore. And it's these breaking waves that either add or take sediment away from the beach or the coast. So there's a video that you can watch later. You might, you'll need to refer to the PowerPoint, the original PowerPoint for this. Um, and that just explains a little bit more about waves, where waves come from and how, uh, how important fetch is. So 
Um, if the wind's blowing over the sea, out, out in the middle of the sea, then waves will start to form and they'll travel towards the coast. So the, depending on which way the wind's blowing, they'll travel towards the coast. And when they get to the coast, they will break onto the shore. So if we've got very dominant waves, they will produce most damage on the coast. Um, if we have winds that commonly blow in the same direction, these are known as prevailing winds. So in the United Kingdom, the prevailing winds are from the southwest. So when the winds most often blow from the southwest. So we'll have more waves on southwest facing beaches than anywhere else in the UK. So here's a little diagram of how the UK is affected by waves. So we have here the United Kingdom here with um, and including Ireland and we have we have the southwest basically prevalent winds that blow waves towards the United Kingdom here. We also have the North Sea off our east coast. So there are of course waves in the North Sea and for different reasons um, than just the fetch because you can see that in the North Sea there is a very short fetch whereas in the on the west coast of the United Kingdom, there is a very long fetch. There's a long distance over which the wind can blow, providing big waves in the um, parts of southwest, like Cornwall and Devon and South Wales here. Um, however, waves in the North Sea are big. Um, they're, they're, it's a very rough sea, in fact, but this is for different reasons that we won't go into here. But um, this, uh, just have in your mind that the prevailing winds in the UK blow from the southwest across the Atlantic, and therefore, generally speaking, high energy coastlines are southwest facing in the UK. So here's a bit more in-depth sort of physics and mechanics of how waves operate. So you should probably pause the video at this point and perhaps take a quick sketch here of what the wave orbit is and how it changes as um, we progress from deep water to more shallow water, how the, the, the orbit of the wave varies. So when out in the ocean, people think that waves actually, or the, the energy is traveling towards the shore, but it, it isn't really. What's actually happening is the water is moving up and down as the energy travels towards the shore. Waves only actually sort of travel towards the shore when they break. So, um, so in the ocean, if you dropped a cork in the, out in the ocean, it would actually bob up and down on the waves. It would not travel in uh, towards the shore. So it's only as we get closer to the shore that the, when the wave orbit changes that particles or people or sediment actually travels towards the, the coast. So um, let's think about now how waves actually break. So here we are out in the ocean. This is quite a complicated diagram that you may want to come back to and perhaps pause the video. But basically as waves approach shallower depths, so the, the, kind of the, as we get towards the shore, the, the land starts to rise. The, the bottom of the wave basically due to friction catches on the floor and because of that it slows down and because it slows down the upper part of the wave is traveling forward at a faster rate than the lower part of the wave it kind of it's like catching your feet on the ground and going over basically so um, the, the wave becomes unstable at this point and it breaks onto the shore so that's how it occurs so a breaker is a type of wave that collapses basically breakers you see them with the white foam approaching the sea uh, the swash is the the energy of the wave going up the beach and the backwash is the energy of the wave going back down the beach so if this still isn't uh, clear to you you might want to pause the video at this point perhaps draw a little sketch of uh, how waves break or perhaps have a little google and watch a couple of videos about how waves break just so you understand why they break at all and how these impact coasts. So here's just another little graphic here of waves breaking. So we see the prevailing wind blowing these waves um, or basically blowing waves towards the shore. We see them out of sea, we see the circular orbit again so the water just kind of goes up and then it goes down again in the circular orbit. As we get towards the sea, towards the shore sorry, the, the orbit of that wave becomes more elliptical here it's quite round. Here it's more an ellipse and even more elliptical here. So the wave base is basically displaying friction here, it's, uh, um, having friction act upon it on the bottom of it, which basically makes the, that uh, orbit more elliptical and eventually the, the wave breaks. And there's some different types of waves really. We, we have um, swell waves 
which are basically waves that break when there isn't any wind. So you might think to yourself, well, well there's no wind. Why have we got a swell? So surfers will wait for a swell. They'll look at the weather forecast and they'll get excited and they'll get the boards out and um, get down the ocean when they know there's going to be a swell. And a swell basically is um, wa basically waves that have been created a long way away. So from a storm out in the Atlantic, perhaps, and it takes a long while for those, wa those waves to come to the coast. So um, swell waves are waves that surfers wait for that um, are big and like this one in the background here. Um, and we have other reasons that waves form. So we've got general waves that just form generally. We have swell waves that are forming from storm events that happened a few days ago out in the ocean. And we also have waves forming um, if you have kind of under undersea earthquakes or volcanoes. A tsunami is a different type of wave which is um, formed when we have kind of a column of water being forced up rapidly. So of the types of waves that occur... Um, uh, in their, uh, their characteristics and their behaviour. We've talked before about destructive and constructive waves. You probably want to pause the video at this point if you're not totally okay with what constructive and destructive waves are and just make a note of the difference between the two. But we'll keep coming back to this because these are the waves that lead to different coastal landforms. Um, so here there's a bit more detail again on those constructive and destructive waves. So you need to have a little... Make sure that you are familiar with the environments that, that would uh, be associated with these type of waves. So if you constructive waves help beaches build up, basically, whereas destructive waves are, are strong on erosion, basically. That's it in a nutshell. Um, constructive waves are more frequent. Destructive waves are less frequent. It depends. that It's not this straightforward, but um, this is the general characteristics, and you could make a note of these general characteristics would be a good idea. Um, waves approaching headlands refract. So this is um, an interesting kind of behaviour that waves have. So as waves hit a headland that's sticking out like this into the sea, they refract, which means that the, the waves bend towards the normal. It doesn't really matter what that is unless you remember it from GCSE physics. But the, the, the fact there is... Um, a headland here causes the waves to bend towards the headland, which concentrates the wave energy at the headland, which leads to higher energy waves. So out here in the ocean, the, the waves uh, would approach kind of dead on to the shore. But if they meet a headland, they're refracted towards the headland, which concentrates the energy. So you end up with high energy waves around a headland and lower energy waves in the bays where the, um, the the waves don't act as strongly. Um, you could refer to the original PowerPoint at this, at this time and look at some wave refraction in action and um, a video here on the signs of big waves. Briefly, briefly touching on tide. So waves are caused by wind or occasionally by earthquakes or volcanoes, but in the case of what we're worrying about, they're caused by the wind. Tides, on the other hand, are caused by our interaction uh, of the, the moon's gravity. So here's the Earth in, in space, and here's our moon and the sun. So the moon has uh, acts, acts upon the Earth. It has um, Obviously, we exert our gravity upon the moon, which is why it orbits around us. But to some extent, the moon exerts gravity on the Earth. And how this manifests itself is in tides. So low and high tides, basically, are caused by the moon. So depending on where the moon is in its orbit around the Earth depends on whether we get high, big tides or lower tides. Big tides means the tidal range is big, so the uh, high tides will be higher and the low tides will be lower. Um, small tides means the tidal range is smaller, so there will be lower high tides and higher low tides, so there isn't so much variety. Um, tidal range is important when we come on to think about features. So in a typical lunar cycle, which as we know, takes a month, so roughly 28 and a half days, roughly. So in a new moon phase, the Earth, the moon and the sun are all lined up and this leads to big spring tides. You can see here we have the, uh, the moon um, egg and the sun acting together and exerting a double influence here to some extent on the, on the tides that occur. So these spring tides will be uh, bigger, the tidal range will be bigger. Once the moon has moved round in a kind of a quarter of the month 
to uh, its position here, the tides will not be as big. So the moon will exert less influence on the Earth. It will, its gravity will exert less influence, so the tides will not be as big. And these are known as neap tides. The sun and the moon are at 90 degrees to each other at this time. When the moon, the full moon, basically uh, unlike the new moon, the full moon is when the moon is on the opposite side of the Earth to the sun. And again, we get the sun and the moon combining to give spring tides again. So the, the sun is acting upon our tides here and the moon is acting upon our tides also. So again, we get big tides, big tides again. And uh, and then we're around to three quarters of the way through the month. We're back to our half moon situation again. And uh, we have neap tides and then we're back to our new moon. So tidal range is also affected on a temporal scale. So tidal range varies um on a monthly cycle basically uh, so that has an important impact upon the coastal environment so you um, there's some um, lots of detail on this slide which I am not going to repeat so you might have to pause the video at this point and have a little read and um, what's interesting though is that if you have a large tidal range you've got a lot of space for the waves to attack so this is a large tidal range here so the, the high tide will be up at the base of the cliff. The low tide is down here where it is. The waves have a long um, uh, distance to travel over and do their erosional work. So here we have a wave cut platform. Sometimes waves, um, tides get funneled into a coast, uh, sorry, into an estuary like the Severn Estuary. The Severn Estuary um, produces some of the biggest tidal balls in the world. Again, this is surfers in the river. This is surfers in a river and at certain times, uh, the River Severn, uh, the tide comes in, there's a particularly high tide, and it goes a long way up the Severn River, and it causes a tidal bore, which is a big wave that basically travels up the river, uh, and it can be, I think it actually can be bigger than one metre, but they travel very fast. Surfers might wait for that wave and travel up the Severn River inland uh, on that wave. So maybe pause the video again and have a little read of this about... Um, Tidal ranges, so like, have a, be aware that the Mediterranean, all the beaches that we like to go on holiday to, they have a very small tidal range. Um, so it's obviously there's still spring and neap tides on on the Mediterranean Sea, but it's to do with also other factors, not just um, what the moon's doing. And uh, and finally, sort of to get towards the end now, you might want to think about how. Process, the processes and, and landforms in coastal areas are affected by these waves, tides and wind. So we've seen sand dunes earlier in our, in our series of lessons and these are wind dominated. The wind transports the sediment and that leads to the formation of a sand dune. Tide dominated environments, mud flats and salt marshes where the, the tide can bring that sediment in. Remember that rivers can also bring that in. But in this uh, case, this is a tidal dominated environment. And then we have wave dominated environments. And these are kind of, these are these are very high energy shore, shore platforms or wave cut platforms, cliffs, beaches, spits. Um, well, these can be in low energy environments, but um, they are wave dominated. So it's, it's a bit of, uh, confusing there in the table. But nevertheless, they are. They are as a result of waves and the, and the way that they transport material. So it's just worth kind of making sure you understand how these three categories work because you could be asked to discuss uh, wave, tide and wind dominated coastal environments and the associated landforms that go with that. And uh, that sort of finishes off our, um, our lecture here uh, on, on waves and tides really and what we'll do in class is work a little bit more on waves and tides and practice some exam questions and look at some environments where different types of waves have caused different landforms to form. So uh, well done for getting through that. It's a bit of a whistle stop tour. There is some reading to do and a lot of classwork to do. So if you have been slightly confused by uh, some of the science and physics in here, don't worry because uh, we'll be coming back to it in class as well. So thank you for listening and I'll see you back.